Welcome to our Wednesday live session with the course instructors. One of the things that uh, we've started to see, which is fantastic, is a good bit of dialogue in the online environment. I just want to share a little bit about working with that in edX. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen and um, just talk a little bit through some of the discussions and so on. I'll try not to get into too much specific detail because uh, th this is posted online and, and we don't necessarily want to have everyone's uh, info available, but just so you're aware, you um, the discussion forums uh, are a little chaotic at times, um, but I'd say the General help and technical questions are probably two of the better environments for you to sort of direct random questions and so on. Um, within the week one environment, you'll see a range of different topics being posted. Now, because edX does things a little bit interesting. Um, so in this case here, we have week one, you've got introduce, share meme, and so on. If you just click week zero, it'll give you all of them in a row. But if you want some different ones, the share meme I've actually looked at, it's an interesting one, uh, some amusing uh, resources, and actually some really nicely articulated resources as well that try and sort of capture the mood and the emotion of this experience are listed there. So if you get a chance, I would say uh, pop in and look through a few of those and share your own. This week, we're obviously in our week one discussion. There's a fair bit of activity that relates to the community of inquiry model and again feel free to just dive in upvote uh, follow or track conversations if you'd like and so on now most of you with the platforms that you have access to probably have a more robust threaded discussion forum than what you'll find in edX there's a reason why a lot of instructors that teach in edX or other platforms often integrate an external discussion threads such as yellow dig or something comparable. The threads in Blackboard, Desire to Learn and Canvas all have a range of additional options and features available. It's worth emphasizing that a discussion forum in many ways is a key part of many online courses, especially for the asynchronous learning and the asynchronous interaction. So it is a nice way to help reflect and build some additional uh, discussions and so on. I'm going to pause here, throw it over to Matt, and then I'll see if I can bring up a blank canvas discussion. I'll just emphasize a few things that I try to focus on in doing a discussion as well and what that might look like. But for now, um, Matt, you want, or hopefully you can share a little bit about the template and the assignment, or not assignment, but the guideline that we hope individuals in the course will go through this week. Sure. All right. Let me bring this up. So uh, we have had a lot of people both. Can you hear me? Everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, I started going and didn't realize it took to see if you can hear me. All right. So we've had a lot of, um, of our faculty at UTA as well as the people online asking for some templates that they can use to help build course materials online rapidly. And we used to have one of those at UTA when we were in Blackboard. Um, and we probably still have one now somewhere. I'm just not sure exactly where. So I decided to build one uh, in Canvas. And I just chose Canvas because uh, they're the top LMS now. That's what we have at UTA. And also because Instructure just loves me so much for asking so many hard questions about their merger on Twitter. So I decided to go with Canvas. And let's see. But because of the way that Canvas uh, works, they have uh, a Canvas Commons. And this link is in the class as, and as part of the uh, set, uh, assignment for this week, uh, where anyone can come in and download, download shared um, uh, resources. And so this one, that particular I've shared, let me get the link and drop it into the uh, chat. You can either import it into your Canvas instance if you want to, or you can download it as an IMS common cartridge and then upload it into other element systems as well. So there's a link for that. And let me share my screen here. Okay, so just a quick run through this template. What you're seeing here, I'm trying to base this on what we've been talking about in this class and give you a template that you can quickly fill out. Um, in your course. I did put a little about this template page in there. Uh, just tells a little bit about it because our university branding there since they always like that. Uh, but you can delete that page. 
basically what it tells you is that I put some examples in here and I, you know, uh, uh, in my undergrad, I studied to teach art and geology at the high school level. So I just started pulling out some geology stuff uh, from my head. And so, but it basically serves as kind of a template that you can replace with your own uh, stuff and then um, uh, use it from there. So the red parts here are stuff that can actually just be read as text and then deleted, kind of explain a few things that I went through, you know, having an intro paragraph, what a goal is, uh, what's one form of objectives? There are different ways to do objectives or any standards. Um, stuff for alignment, stuff for activities in there, some ideas for activities, and some other uh, details that students like to hear, like how much time you think it'll take them to um, take that week. This first page right here is probably the longest page, just so you know, not everything's going to take as long to fill out here, but there's just uh, some ideas and examples there. And I dropped in a kind of a sample reading or watching list. This is kind of based on the blog post that I did about creating a, um, a content source very quickly through doing a Google search and then putting together the option, the uh, resources that you think students could learn the most from. Maybe dropping a bit of your thoughts on each one in there that kind of adds a little bit of a teacher presence to it there. Um, you can go, you can put more than I put there, of course, but that's just an idea of what you could do show them and then some of these things say how I didn't think these are perfect resources but I'm sharing them anyway so look for this but not that dropped in next in there a discussion forum uh, like we have in our courses this is a good way to build into the social presence between your learners especially if you focus on, on asking them uh, some uh, some deeper questions some more problem-based questions or something that uh, wouldn't be the same answer for all the learners as well there's some uh, instructions in there for making this maybe a low stress activity or something that students uh, could um, enjoy. Let's see. Then I dropped in an idea for a project there. This is based more kind of on a um, problem-based, uh, group-based learning type thing. Uh, it's basically looking at um, the current issue of the pandemic and how does that apply to geology. Um, and the students that have a different choice of uh, ways they could turn it in since so different students will have different technology skills. And so uh, it's kind of based more on the idea of passing, uh, have the pass fail method or pass revise method, how you want to say it. But I did throw in an example rubric there that's a little bit more open ended. It allows you to get feedback. You can add points there like I have if you want to, take the points off if you want to. As you can see, it kind of focuses more on things like accuracy, quality, helpfulness, uh, and the reflection they do. And then I also, but the, the main point of the assignment kind of comes to the reflection, which is also what I dropped in there, which builds that cognitive presence from the community of inquiry model where they think through why they chose what they chose, uh, what worked for them, what didn't. And then this is where they actually turn in the assignment. So again, we're just trying to not only give a template, but also model some of the um, ideas that we've been sharing as far as ungrading and community of inquiry and those kind of things. And also in Canvas, they do have a rubric tool. I put this in here to use a rubric as an open communication tool to kind of take the place of some of those conversations that you would have with students who just walk in and want to ask you about the assignment or those kind of things. Uh, my students have uh, really enjoyed this uh, part of the, the uh, way that I run my classes. It just it gives them some feedback on um, the different areas of the project as well. And then I believe um, uh, just at the end of it, it has a little section for what's up next week. That just helps learners get an idea of what's going to be happening next week. Also, the project that I designed in here is one that would last for several weeks. Uh, so that I'm not necessarily having to create a new assessment every single week that we're, you know, in this uh, uh, COVID situation. So uh, this also goes through and tells them they'll have several weeks and when it will be due as well. And that's just kind of the basic run through of what I put in the template. Again, it's it's free to download. It's in the Canvas Commons. You can import into Canvas course. Uh, we also put a link to there's a, a Word doc version of it and there's also a Google Docs version of it. So in case the um, uh, Canvas Commons option doesn't work, you can um, go to uh, use the Word doc and hopefully copy and paste that into whatever system you have. So that's a basic rundown of that. Great, thanks very much, Matt. And uh, for others, the, the reason we're giving the, the template is uh, just to give you some quick guidance on what you may want to bring in.
when you're involved in these uh, starting to move your curriculum online. It just gives you a tool at least to think about, obviously, short term with the number of things that many of you have going on. You may not have the opportunity to be as focused as you would like to be. As we tried to explain this week, you've got a sort of a double hump effect going where short term, it's about doing what you can to get online as best as you can. The primary motivating interest should be around connecting with your students and as much as possible, creating an environment where you're flexible and responsible, uh, responsive to their needs because they're in as much chaos right now as probably many of you are. Longer term though, uh, more focused structured planning, this is for your summer and fall courses, will uh, be in order for, for many of you and for many of us I think that recognizing that even when we bounce back from whatever this thing is, there will probably be sustained changes on technology use on many campuses. So. That's the intent of the template, is just to give you something to think with, use the parts of it that are relevant, use the parts that are useful, and thanks, Matt, for pulling that together. If you are in edX, you'll be able to access a number of different formats of that template that you can use uh, just to engage with. Now, for any of you, as we've emphasized several times, a big part of this course is you sharing with one another, you teaching one another, because the expertise isn't in the course facilitation exclusively. Many of you have deep areas of expertise in, in different areas and can provide a lot of value by sharing your outputs, your templates, your resources with others. So if you do use it, you do make some adjustments to the template, you add parts that in, include video elements or how you've structured your teaching activities, please share it back to the group, the degree that you're comfortable with in edX. Um, Negan. What have you noticed in the discussion forums or anything of interest that's kind of uh, struck you from your lofty perch in the Swiss Alps? Oh, I wish I was in the Swiss Alps right now instead of my home stuck here. Anyways, um, I was looking through the discussion forum that was around the community of inquiry reflection. So I was looking through that um, just this morning, because I saw that there were a few new posts this morning. So um, don't feel that it's too late to post your contribution. Um, but the thing that really struck me was um, with the COI, um, and we're talking about the three different presences um, in the model, teaching presence, cognitive presence, social presence. Um, what came through for me with some of the comments and discussion that was happening in there is that given the current environment that we're in, um, the question was raised as to, does there need to be a, a balance between these three presences or are there certain times where one might be um, more heavily weighted in a sense? Um, so Sarah had posted a comment around idealized influence and this notion of how um, given the turmoil that, that we're teaching in, keeping in mind we're all human um, and that we're trying our best to thrive in this new world of um, pivoting online and our students are watching that happening um, and hopefully that gives them a bit of support and that they can thrive in these new challenges as well. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting post there um, and that it's that notion of their being in that social presence in a way and a bit of that teaching presence in a way for the students to relate to us as people, um, that we're not just, you know, an online course without the personality and the frustration and the challenge that we're trying to go through. Um, so really helping them relate to us. Now, Margarita um, posted in similar lines as well. Um, and that was more, you know, at specific times, is there that, diff are all three presences necessary? Do we sometimes focus more on a particular one? So right now, is it perhaps it's important to really be involved with our students and create that social presence, that trust, um, new online learning experiences for many of them. They're going through a lot of challenges um, at, in their homes. Um, so is it, you know, is it, a, is it a time where we actually delve in more into that social presence perhaps? Um, on the flip side, maybe it's time that we are actually quite heavily in the teaching presence as well especially initially in these first few weeks, um, there was a, a comment and I think the surname was probably Widener, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but something around the, um, initially would there be a lot more teaching presence and then as 
the community is established, um, could that wane a little bit? Um, and I would say absolutely. Um, and not just in these times, but in generally in online teaching, um, I often find that initially there's a lot more of my time going in if it's um, facilitating discussion forums, for example. The first few weeks are so critical um, and more time consuming in terms of responding to students and um, being engaged in that form. And once you kind of set that up, um, over time it does actually wane um, in that their relation, the trust is built, the relationships are set up, and they're able to communicate without having um, you as the teacher in there as much. Um, so yes, absolutely, I agree that um, initially there's probably quite a bit of teacher presence and then that would slowly wane as the students get involved. Um, but those were some of the highlights um, that I picked up when I was looking at, the, at that particular community of inquiry forum, but I see that there's a few more posts coming in um, today as well. Great, thanks. Thanks, Negan. And I think as we addressed previously, the many of the, the tools that you're looking at, when you get into a new space, and this is the same thing our students go through, but when you get into a new space, uh, everything is disconnected, right? So, so there's, and the value of a framework is that it helps us pull these pieces together a little bit. So when you first go online, What's the role of discussion forums? What's the role of supporting students? How do you address questions? And the list goes on. All of that is really disconnected in your first experience. The value of a framework then is it helps give you a rough set of cohesion on how these pieces play in. And you can reflect on what degree different elements should uh, be allocated or to what level should we try and focus on social interaction versus content presentation and so on. Obviously, things change significantly based on the kinds of curriculum that you're teaching and the kinds of resources that you're doing. So there's no clear set right or wrong way to structure this and do it. So I just want to emphasize that's the point of the community of inquiry model is it helps to cohere the many different parts of your online experience in as functional a way as possible in the short term. In the long run, anyone who is who's spent a lot of time teaching online or teaching in a classroom, you find that you still use those frameworks as a little bit of guidance, but you modify and constantly make changes. So it's just quick onboarding to the online environment, why we have things like the community of inquiry framework and why we're sharing templates like Matt did. Justin, I know you've been uh, busy getting all kinds of stuff done and getting things up into the uh, online environment um, and you know, getting people uh, up to speed and communicating and the list goes on. Uh, what are you noticing in the course so far? So a couple things. Uh, first off, this is definitely a global course. Um, we have over 90 countries represented right now, which is really exciting. Um, it's really great to um, be able to communicate with a lot of different people um, who have different uh, unique needs. But um, I think that uh, it's it's really interesting to see some of the perspectives uh, that, that are going to definitely come across. Um, hopefully, if people are doing a good job, you know, engaging in the forums and communicating with each other. One one of the things that we've marketed this to post secondary um, when when we originally wrote the description for the course, but we do have a lot of people in here from the K twelve sector, um, from not just the U S. but globally. Um, we have people working from from government training, um, yeah, industry, um, as well as. Um, those that are um, instructors and even graduate uh, teaching assistants in this course as well. So it's um, it's obviously a big issue. It's on a lot of people's minds right now about how we can do this well and and um, you know what the research says and how we can do this effectively. I think is just a, you know a, cre a key thing that I think is um, getting some good traction. So um, I think uh, you know one of the things that. I just highly encourage everybody to do, whether you're in this live session now or, um, or watching us at a later times, you know, don't be afraid to get in there. You don't have to do a, I think someone posted a funny uh, meme that was like, oh, I wrote a five paragraph, you know, really detailed thing and then forgot to, you know, hit submit and lost everything. Um, you know, it's one of those things you don't need to write a big five paragraph discussion to, to you know, participate in this course. I mean, small things, ideas, hey, I saw this, what do you think of this? Or, hey, I saw you guys posted this paper. Um, I have some questions around this. It can, it can just be that. Um, you know, we can have conversations in here as well as on Twitter using the hashtag. And um, we're going to definitely start to curate some things from there. 
and, and bring that more into the course as we go forward. But and we want to really know, you know, issues that you're having, um, some challenges that you're facing and, and ways that we can be able to better support you throughout the course. Um, that's one of the things, you know, we, we talked about really early on was making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're meeting your needs while also providing the good research and formal ones through it. So um, just, again, encourage you to continue to be in there. And that's why we have things like, you know, share a meme, just trying to you know, build some community, have the opportunity for you to connect with each other and, and then bring some of your personality into the course. Great, thanks, Justin. Tanya, I'm not sure how you're feeling if you want to dive in and uh, you are alive. Yay. Um, yeah, how alive. are things going on your end? How's life in sunny Wisconsin? It actually is a little sunny today and um, warm, which is good. Um, I just had two things to mention. One, as George just alluded to, I have been very sick. I came down with the coronavirus. And so um, just a couple things as you're teaching um, thinking about teaching and also thinking about your students is what do you do in case you get sick because there are so many. Um, luckily for me, I get a good few hours in a day before I took a dive. The urgent cares and the ERs are not testing you for coronavirus um, unless you're admitted to the hospital because we're short on tests. So just keep that in mind if you're asking for documentation. I think this is again where as I'm running out of breath here, <laughs> as you are um, flexible and patient with your students as well as with yourself. So as you're setting up your course to go for the rest of the term here, just keep that in mind that you might run into a situation where you need some flexibility. Um, the second thing that I would mention, um, and just to reemphasize as Matt talked about the template, we haven't done research on the template itself, but the template is a great tool to drive home the variables as far as organization, ease of learning and clarity, which we know statistically significantly impact student outcomes. So um, the template actually is pretty important. You can make the template for your course, whatever you want it to be. But having some sort of organization um, for your course every week or so forth that includes um, an introduction and an overview is really helpful because again, you're organizing these materials online and that sort of classroom for your students where it might be new for them and, and their sense of direction online is a little bit off. And I think also it eliminates a hurdle for them when they're learning um, if everything is easier for them to find rather than just putting up um, a bunch of notes and links and files, um, you know, which I think a lot of us ran into in the early days. And so try to avoid that by using a template that you, you create just to, um, because we know, you know through the research that the organization and um, creating that ease of learning, reducing those barriers for students is super important. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tanya. And uh, sorry to hear you're not feeling well, but sorry to hear you're feeling better. And I think you raised a really critical point there that we haven't talked about. We've been talking about, you know, teaching online. We haven't talked about the reality that uh, people do get sick and people will be impacted uh, by, by coronavirus or by flu or by other things. You're having a different cycle, a different routine and so on. So uh, thank you for raising that as a, something to be critically aware of. What I'd like to do now is just very briefly share the bibliography that we have set up for the course and where to find that for those of you that are interested. Uh, at the same time, those of you that have questions, please uh, drop in and share those now uh, so we can just kind of shift into those once I'm done here. So when you log into the course in edX, you'll find, you, you'll see something slightly different. You won't see the instructor tab and random things like that. But when you click the main course tab, as you scroll down, you'll see some of the resources that have been set up and obviously how to navigate through that. Uh, and each of the weeks is set up here. So you can go uh, look at some of the details or what's required on, you know, or what's, what's available for you to review from activities that we've done in the past and so on. And then week one, of course, is where we are now. And you'll see the different resources that have been set up there. Um, I'm very sad that my Making Sense of Online podcast with Dave Cormier uh, was rendered optional. It hurt my feelings. Now, so when you go to resources, you'll see the master bibliography. 
And the master bibliography is just a selection of articles and resources that we thought would be useful for you to be aware of. You may want to touch on these as you have a moment. You may want to focus on these over the longer term. But for the time being, we just pulled together what we thought were useful articles of interest, things like a framework around the community of inquiry model, which many of you uh, see it as, as uh, or have seen as being critical within the course. We've also pulled together a number of comparative studies. Now, comparative studies are pretty much what you would expect. There's a number of analysis and meta-analysis that look at how effective is teaching online. And the short version is there's no real difference between teaching online versus teaching in a classroom environment in terms of outcomes. There's some significant difference on peripheral elements, but the online environment per se doesn't necessarily have a dramatically different kind of an impact on outcomes. You can look at some of the dynamics and the ways in which it's different. And this has been articulated in the past under the umbrella of no significant difference. There's a website that's de dedicated to that as well. It gives you a bit of insight, but I just want to emphasize that there are dynamics about the online environment that can duplicate what happens in classroom. But as we said right at the start, it's not better, it's not worse, but it is different. And you can produce suboptimal learning outcomes when things aren't properly designed. That's not your goal right now because we're just trying to get functional, but over the next few months, you may want to start looking more aggressively at the literature. One of the recordings you may have seen in the interviews this week was with Justin Reich from MIT. I had a quick chat with him and he really emphasized that there is a type of a cost that comes from going online and that cost is borne heavily by students who come from a sort of a uh, lower socioeconomic status or some kind of a, of a, you know, that type of a background, which produces a, some unfortunate, uneven impacts on our students. So we want to make sure that we're also aware that while the medium in a generic sense is consistent in its outcomes, if it's designed well, compared with classroom environments, it produces uneven outcomes when you reflect on the, the uh, different dynamics that are affiliated with uh, you know, socioeconomic and, and other backgrounds. But anyways, have a look at the comparative studies. We also have a few sections there that relates to video. How do you teach well using video? What works and what doesn't work when you're in these online kinds of settings, especially with instructional videos? A number of these resources have focused on massive open online courses. And as a result, they have a, a bit of a bias towards a certain kind of production of video. But regardless, have a look at exactly what works and the, the role of, of video in that end. This will be a little bit more uh, relevant next week. Next week, we're looking at how to produce content for the online environment. There's also a number of resources that look at the nature of interaction. Uh, how do you promote interaction in distance environments and how do you begin to assess the effectiveness of different kinds of interactions? For this week, you may find the discussion forum questions of interest. As I noted earlier, discussion forums are quite central in many online courses. It allows students to essentially teach one another for lack of a better word and is quite useful to have that kind of interaction opportunity. Uh, it does shift the, the focus and the power students redirect the nature of the conversation. If you're a faculty member teaching, you control the provision of content and the nature of student interactions. When you open it up and students can engage and share, you'll find that they follow many peripheral rabbit holes and share resources that you might not even have been aware of or might not have planned for. That can be tremendously rich as a learning experience, but can also produce some uneven impacts that require you to periodically intervene and say, hey, uh, you know, let's, you know, this is what we're focusing on. There's also a section around social networks, which can be analyzed and understood in online settings because you have traces that are left that indicate I spoke with you, you spoke with me, and so on. It looks like we've got a little bit of a, of a break here uh, in these two. But uh, so there's the, this particular text and there's the one with Jock Simovich uh, here that'll need to be uh, moved over. Um, and then of course we have self-regulation uh, available as well. Uh, articles on just why self-regulation is important because a big goal, and we'll share this in a video uh, interview I did with Dragan Gasevich, who is the lead on this particular paper, uh, where he emphasizes the need for us to create adaptive learners, not adaptive learning, meaning the emphasis on creating the skill sets and the capability of our students to function in that environment. There's a few additional resources. There's one here um, that I think will, will be of interest. Uh, there, uh, so Matt can maybe chat a little bit about the interest in or that particular resource. 
Uh, there's also some videos that Matt has available and a few other resources too that we'll eventually set up as, as hyperlinks and get a little bit more resources available for you to follow up down the road. So there's a few additional resources there just to, to look at. There's Tanya's work with data in terms of a research database and the list goes on and on and on. So basically, this is a starting point. We'll keep revising it and improving it and updating it uh, as we go through the course. Now, I am going to stop there and ask Matt to talk about his his, uh, uh, his book that he did with UTA Press, if you have a moment to share that. And what readers can expect besides frivolity, wisdom, and fulfillment. Okay, so yeah, the book, uh, let me get the link to that, is an OER. Uh, you can download it in several different uh, formats. I dropped the link in the chat there. Uh, if you really want to, you can buy the print version for uh, like $11 it costs. Uh, we don't make any money off that, but if you're a print uh, person, I have it around here somewhere, you get it. Uh, but what we did is it started off kind of focused as a, a book about doing MOOCs and then we kept expanding it. Uh, George recommended we expand it to uh, online learning in general, not just MOOCs. And so, my goal was to pull in as many people as I could get to contribute parts to it. Uh, and so um, people could contribute a section or a paragraph or an entire chapter if they wanted to. So uh, we ended up with about uh, seven or eight people, including Justin, who's in on this call, contributing um, sections to it. And then I sent out a, a, a broader uh, request to people that I knew from Twitter from different places around the world to kind of review it and give us some feedback to make sure that it wasn't just uh, made for the uh, specific American um, university mindset. Uh, and so what we produced was this book um, called The uh, Creating Online Learning Experiences. And it basically goes through uh, a lot of the basics. It starts with some philosophy uh, and then goes through uh, some of the practicals gets into creating effective course content, and it even gets into uh, some uh, more details about creating quality videos, about uh, mindfulness in online courses. Uh, the whole chapter 12 on mindfulness in online courses uh, has really been uh, helpful to some people in this time to, to practice with their students kind of that self care and thinking through mindfulness. And that was by that chapter was by Catherine Spam, who used to work with us at the Link Research Lab. And then also it gets into some advanced course design things, uh, gamification, uh, some of the pathways work that we've been doing at the Link Lab and stuff like that. So again, it's a free resource and you're free to download it. Also of note, we have enabled hypothesis on the pages of all the books. So if you want to add some notes or some thoughts or some ideas or some corrections, uh, feel free to drop those in hypothesis and you can uh, add your thoughts or ideas to the book as well. All right, great, thanks, Matt. Well, on that note, I don't have anything else that I'd like to cover as of today. Tanya, Justin, Nagin, anything on your end? Um, only thing is I know, uh, I think Henrietta asked in the chat for some resources around assessment. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to share some resources on assessments in the next um, couple of days for maybe Justin to put up. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have any other things that you can think of, again, just please put it in the discussion forum. We'd be one we'd be happy to look at it or even the general help. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think Henrietta was saying um, we need to make changes to assessments ASAP. Um, I know we're struggling with that in our institution right now as well in terms of setting up support and resources for academics because with the transition online, obviously some assessments that might have been face-to-face -face now have to be re rethinked about and rethought about. Um, so yeah, I'll try to share some resources with you. Okay, um, there was also a question I just saw come in here around strategies for managing discussion boards when there's a lot of participants. 
you know, you'll see what we, we grapple with that within edX as well. I'm just quickly going to share my screen again to give you a bit of an overview of just the, the uh, this is one example of the Canvas environment, a few particular strategies that you can use. And I just set it up as a, a, uh, a course that doesn't violate any student's privacy. So the general environment that has been set up when you're in Canvas, there's a few specific functions that are useful to look at. Like, first of all, I always prefer threaded replies so that you can actually see what relates to what. Some, now, this is if you're doing it in Canvas. Like I said, in edX, you have a different set of constraints. Uh, a good one that we talked about last week was this idea that users must post before seeing replies. I found this to be quite helpful when students are worried about everything's been said already and they come by and say, well, I got nothing to add. So in this case, it's fine if there's duplication, but it's uh, also quite helpful to uh, ensure that, that students are forming their own ideas rather than being intimidated by what others said. Uh, there's obviously a range of options that are at a bit of a meta level commentary. You'll see this even in our own discussion forums where you can like and you can upvote, if you will, or, or uh, favorite particular threads that you'd be interested in as well. Another aspect that's useful is the timelines so that you don't have discussions that run indefinitely. And of course, in many cases, people like to shut them down after uh, about, uh, you know, the, the end of the week concludes and then you move on to the next topic. It, it can prevent some trailing engagement, which I mean, I personally generally don't mind, but uh, let's say you have a course uh, such as many of you do, and I have one with 130 students right now, your discussions get out of control really quickly if you don't sort of have some constraints placed on them. So that's just generally the environment and in terms of setting up the environment. Uh, what I'd like to address is the broader question about how do you manage to make these things work effectively? And I, I'll also ask uh, Nagan Matt, Tanya and Justin to comment on this as well, but generally I found when you post your discussion forums, make them meaningful. Uh, students quickly sense when it's like, oh man, we got to jump through hoops that don't have anything to do with anything. So I typically focus on, for example, one course I'm teaching now is on cognitive processes and we've got a week right now where we're looking at complex uh, knowledge processes and how we remember complex and integrated experiences. And so I tried to tie that to some of the information concerns that are around today. Things like gaslighting and people who may have different experiences or encounters with different kinds of information. So I, I find that it's useful if you're taking concepts and you make them personally relevant to students, either in terms of their social media or in terms of some of the daily experiences that they might be having. I also find that clustering different kinds of topics is helpful. It helps uh, break up students uh, or student groups in a way that, that minimizes the longer term impact of having a discussion that has 400 different threads in it and actually makes a better impact that way in terms of focused interaction. Also breaking things up into uh, assigning groups different topics where you might say this group deals with this area, this group over here, or this cluster of students deals with that area. So there's a range of things in that regard that helps make them much more effective and also gives you the opportunity to then assign a student in each of the smaller subgroups the ability to, or the responsibility, I should say, to summarize the discussion and broadly share that back with the other groups later on. Um, and, and so, you know, those are just a few quick strategies that, that you can use to get going. I do find that an instructor in a discussion forum Typically, I, I would encourage you to be present, obviously, that so they know you're reading and posting, but where possible, let students go through the process of this kind of engagement with one another so that they get the, the get into a habit of meeting one another's needs and, and answering one another's questions. A little bit of patience, I've found, helps many students answer, answer questions for one another, and that does help promote a bit of a culture where they're not expecting the faculty member to come in and do everything. But I'll I see if there's some comments going on in here. Why don't we start with Tanya? What have you found from a that works well in managing discussion forums? Yeah, I actually um, it's one of my areas that I research and teach in is um, groups and teams, and I've been doing that probably since the '90s. Um, wrote a thesis and a dissertation on groups, but um, one of the things I think is um, like what are we talking about is large and what are they doing so um, again this goes back to what is the task and um, you know what's sort of the appropriate characteristics of the activity 
Um, for large groups, so if we're talking like 50 or plus students, I break them into, uh, break them down. And um, if they are talking, and I guess it also depends for me if it's an undergraduate class or a graduate class, if they are talking about the reading or lecture or those sorts of things, like having a discussion, um, you know, where I might come in and provide context, real life situations and extend that discussion. Um, what I usually try to do is have those groups when it's undergraduates to be 15 or more people. Um, but I usually try to cap it around 25. Sometimes I've gone to 35. With undergraduates, you need, if you're discussing something, they need a little bit of a larger side size. If they're project teams, like they're doing a, a group project, then they should be in smaller sizes. You know, the research back to the 50s, um, you get some pretty consistent evidence there when you're online. We have a little bit of um, people falling into cyberspace. Um, but I usually have six to eight per project teams for group discussions. Yeah, I'd say 15 to 35, if that um, makes sense. Um, or helps anyone. <laughs> Thanks, Tanya. Megan, what have you found? Um, I found that um, setting up expectations right at the very front, right at the start of the course helps. So making it really clear to students what, when you're going to be engaging in the forum. So at least they know when to expect a response. Um, often when we go online, people start thinking it's a 24 hour, seven days a week sort of life, and it's not. Um, that, that would be very challenging to do. So I think it's really important to set it up right up front in terms of um, how often you're going to respond and when you're going to respond. Um, so if you know, you, you're planning to respond to your forums from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. every morning. Um, make that really clear to your students so that if they post at 10 o'clock at night, they're not going to get a response from you until the following day. Or you might even say, actually, it's going to be more like a 48 hour turnaround. It's not going to be immediate. Our students are often in a world of immediacy these days. Um, so you just want to be really clear with your expectations so that they know when to expect a response from you. And also to, again, reiterate to them that um, they can respond to each other um, if you haven't yet been able to respond to them. Um, the other element I think, and then George picked up on it, was around summaries. And I think, um, I think that's really helpful, um, either getting other students to come up with a summary for you or you even telling your students, look, I'm not necessarily going to reply to everyone's post, but the end of the topic or the end of the week, I'm going to send out um, an announcement or I'll do one post that kind of summarizes the key points that come through. Um, so again, it's that expectation sort of setting thing in terms of how you're going to be engaging with them um, so that they don't expect you to reply to every post that they make, um, but they know that you're in there and you're looking at it because you're going to be using that for the summary that you do. Um, and another way that I've done it, if it really gets really big and it's even hard to even do that, is to ask them to pick their top posts or, you know, you can say, send me two posts from this week or send me three posts from the last month and these are the ones I'm going to look at and respond to. So, um, yeah, expectation setting is huge in um, online teaching. Thanks, Nagan. And it's worth noting, as Tanya uh, just pointed out, is that we do pick this up later on. And we do discuss this, I think it's in week three. Next week, we're talking content creation and tools for doing that. The following week, I believe we're looking at fostering interaction if I've got my timelines correct. So we'll do a greater or more of a you know, deeper dive into it at that point. Matt, Justin, any of your, anything to add regarding the use of discussion forums from you? Yeah, I agree with what's been said. I also tell my students from the very beginning that you don't have to read every single one of them. I kind of compare it to social media, uh, Facebook or Twitter or, you know, whatever uh, new tools they may be using that it, you, you generally find the people that you connect with well and you read theirs and kind of respond to theirs. And I start seeing that uh, students will do that. I also remind they, they can scroll the bottom of the uh, forum if they want to and find people that haven't been responded to yet if they want to. Um, and I've also found that if I get in there, I start responding to a lot of people, then all of a sudden all the responses start looking the same because they're just trying to please me because I'm the instructor and they see what I'm responding to and then they start adjusting their responses to that. 
So I love the ideas of telling them you're not going to respond to every single one, but you may give a summary or you may, you know, get, uh, you know, or you may just, uh, you know, tell them about it in a separate email or something at the end so that that way they uh, don't get as influenced by you as the instructor when they're, when they're there as well. So. Thanks. Anything from your end, Justin? No magical mind. So. <laughs> no, that's good. You guys have covered all. All right. Well, uh, I think at that point, we are at wrap up mode. Thanks everybody for joining us tomorrow. Uh, Dave Cormier and I will be hosting an optional discussion of random news and views related to what's going on around COVID and higher education. That's at the same time, same location. And like I said, it's just more of a, of a quick run through a couple of the topics that might be of interest or that you might want to be aware of. Thanks all for joining us. Hope you have a great rest of your day and we will see some of you at least tomorrow.